you know, I never had any hobbies because people said, what do you do? And I said, I take singing lessons, I take dancing lessons, and I take acting lessons. <laughs> and those are my hobbies, I guess, Amazing. you know? Ever hear of an actress who shines so brightly in a role that it's hard to forget, only for her to suddenly vanish from the limelight? Sandal Bergman, the athletic beauty who captured hearts in. Conan the Barbarian did just that. After mesmerizing audiences alongside Arnold Schwarzenegger, she seemingly stepped back from prominent Hollywood roles, leaving fans puzzled. What made Bergman transition from a shining star to a mystery? Let's dive into her captivating journey and discover the enigma that is Sandal Bergman. The rise of Sandal Bergman. Sandal Bergman's journey in the world of entertainment is one that resonates with the classic tale of a small town girl making it big in the city. Born on November 14, 1951, in Kansas City, Missouri, Bergman's tall, slender figure and athletic prowess hinted at a destiny away from the ordinary even during her early years. Her height, reaching a striking six feet, though she'd cheekily claim she was 5'12", humorously stating, no girl should have to be six feet, set her apart and paved a path toward a career that would be nothing short of remarkable. Growing up, Bergman was drawn to the world of theater and acting. Her initial forays into the realm of performing arts began at Shawnee Mission East High School, where she was part of various productions. It was here on the local stages of her hometown that fortune first smiled on Sandal. The acclaimed choreographer Tommy Toon happened to be visiting Kansas and upon witnessing her performance, recognized her innate talent. This serendipitous discovery was a turning point in Bergman's life. At the tender age of 15, Toon handed her an equity card along with a golden opportunity, a trip to Broadway. Taking the leap, Bergman moved to New York in her 20s. The city, with its bustling theater district and artistic energy, was the perfect platform for her to hone her craft. She graced the stages of several Broadway shows, embracing every role with the enthusiasm and passion of a true artist. However, her big break came when the iconic choreographer Bob Fosse took notice of her. Impressed by her dancing prowess, Fosse cast her as a replacement dancer in a production of Pippin. This collaboration marked the beginning of a fruitful partnership, as Bergman and Fosse developed a strong professional rapport, working together on numerous occasions thereafter. 1974 was a landmark year for Bergman. She made her film debut as a dancer in Mame. This was followed by roles in well-received musicals like Gigi in 1973 and Mac and Mabel in 1974. Yet it was the 1977 critically acclaimed musical A Chorus Line that further cemented her reputation in the industry. Fosse, ever the admirer of her talent, cast her once more in his musical Dancin' in 1978. Bergman often recounted how this particular film challenged her, pushing her boundaries. Unlike traditional musicals, Dancin' had fewer breaks between dance numbers, making the experience intensely demanding. But Bergman rose to the challenge, and her commitment to the craft made her an even more sought-after talent. Newsweek hailed her performance in All That Jazz in 1979, where she featured in the Air Otica scene as the most high-voltage, blazingly erotic dance sequence ever filmed. Such commendations weren't rare, Bergman's captivating presence on screen and stage drew attention from many in the industry. Even Dean Martin became a fan, casting her in The Dean Martin Show. As Bergman continued to climb the ladder of success, her roles grew more diverse and challenging. Her talent wasn't confined to dance alone. Her acting prowess shone brightly. Conan the Barbarian, a magnum opus? In 1982, a film arrived on the silver screen, heralding a new age of fantasy, action, and romance. Conan the Barbarian, with its pulsating narrative, intricate world-building, and unforgettable characters, was an offering that was unlike anything audiences had seen before. But who would have thought that a film born from a 1930s fantasy tale would evolve into an opus so grand and so deeply revered? The film's roots trace back to the realm of fantasy stories where Conan's tale first began. In the original narrative, Conan's heart is enthralled by a pirate queen named Bellet, who is heralded as his great love. Yet the film's creators chose a different muse for the barbarian, a decision that brought the character of Valeria to the fore. 
An Amazonian force to be reckoned with, Valeria was portrayed as Conan's equal, matching his ferocity in battle and depth of character while being bound to him by unwavering love and loyalty. The movie's transition from video to celluloid wasn't straightforward. The initial drafts painted a dystopian future, a four-hour magnum opus visualized by Oliver Stone. However, budget constraints and a change in directorial vision under John Milius sculpted the narrative to the form we know today. Interestingly, Milius confessed to having little knowledge about the original Conan character when he signed on. His motivation? A latent desire to create a Viking movie. Central to the film's story was its casting. Arnold Schwarzenegger, with his hulking frame and raw charisma, was always the preferred choice for Conan. Yet the role of Valeria remained open, a question mark waiting for its perfect answer. The moment Sandal Bergman walked into the audition room, that question was put to rest. I think we've found our Valeria, declared Milius, having been mesmerized by Bergman's dance in All That Jazz. He envisioned Valeria moving with a ballerina's grace even in the fiercest battle scenes, a vision he believed only Sandal could bring to life. Even the legendary Bob Fosse had whispered words of recommendation for Bergman. With casting complete, the challenges of bringing the tale to life began. For Bergman, the role of Valeria wasn't just about acting, it demanded physical rigor and unparalleled commitment. Matching Schwarzenegger's formidable presence required her to push her limits. A testament to her dedication was the fact that she, much like Arnold, performed her own stunts. Finding a stunt double to match her stature proved elusive, so Bergman took on the challenge head-on, even at the risk of her own safety. She once reminisced about the film's demanding shoot, recalling an incident where she narrowly avoided losing a finger. Yet, the results of this dedication were palpable. Every scene with Valeria radiated with intensity, every battle sequence a dance of death and beauty. The training, under martial arts master Kiyoshi Yamazaki, transformed Bergman into a warrior, earning her Arnold's admiration. The two would often spar, a testament to their commitment and the bond they forged during the film's production. Upon its release, Conan the Barbarian was an avalanche of success. Audiences thronged theaters with bodybuilders and film enthusiasts alike waiting for hours to be part of Conan and Valeria's journey. The film's commercial success was mirrored by its critical acclaim. Nominations poured in, and among the awards it bagged, one stood out for Bergman. Her portrayal of Valeria earned her the Golden Globe for New Star of the Year, a crown jewel in her career. Why Sandal disappeared from the limelight, Hollywood, in its gleaming allure and unmatched dazzle, is often a stage for meteoric rises. Stars, with their blinding brilliance, ascend rapidly, illuminating the cinematic sky. Sandal Bergman, with her unforgettable portrayal of Valeria in Conan the Barbarian, was one such star. Mysteriously as she had risen, she receded from the forefront, leaving many to wonder. Why did Sandal Bergman fade from the limelight? Post Conan, the pathways of stardom lay open for Bergman. The industry was abuzz with her talent, and audiences were eager for more. The choices she made in this pivotal phase were, however, unexpected. While many actors would have seized this momentum to catapult further into leading roles, Bergman's decisions were markedly different. She starred in Red Sonja in 1985, a film in the same vein as Conan. Interestingly, though offered the lead role, she chose to play the antagonist, indicating a desire to explore diverse roles rather than adhere to a typecast. However, it was also noted that Bergman was absent from Conan the Destroyer, the direct sequel to her magnum opus, a decision that intrigued many. While she did continue acting, appearing in films like Hell Comes to Frogtown and The Dark Comedy, Ice Cream Man, these roles did not match the scale or prominence of Conan. The movies she chose post her breakout role were eclectic, and while they showcased her versatility, they did not always succeed at the box office. Speculation about her gradual retreat from mainstream cinema was rife. Some believed it was the sheer intensity and physical demands of her role in Conan that made her reconsider the trajectory of her career. After all, the filming had been grueling, and she'd come perilously close to severe injuries, 
Others surmised that perhaps Hollywood, with its glitz and relentless pace, wasn't as appealing to Bergman as it appeared. Was she looking for roles with depth, waiting for the right script, or was there an unseen factor guiding her choices? A significant insight into Bergman's choices post-Conan lay in her personal life. While professionally she was scaling heights, her personal journey was evolving too. Bergman, inherently private about her personal life, rarely made headlines in the tabloids. Yet snippets from her life hinted at a woman deeply committed to her loved ones. She dated journalist Charlie Rose and was later married to actor Josh Taylor, with whom she had a son, Joshua. For Bergman, family seemed to be an anchoring force, and it's conceivable that she chose roles and projects that allowed her to maintain a balance between her professional ambitions and personal commitments. The world of fitness and dance also beckoned her. With her athletic build and dance background, Bergman fits seamlessly into the exercise video craze of the 80s. Her foray into fitness, with projects like Sandal Bergman's Body, showcased another facet of her talent. These ventures, while not cinematic, were still avenues of expression and perhaps offered her the space and flexibility she desired. The Unusual Interjection Hitler in Cartoons and Amp Animes Animation has often been a realm where imagination runs wild, bringing to life tales of joy, adventure, and mystery. Yet within this colorful tapestry, there are times when a shadow from reality intrudes. An unusual, perhaps unexpected figure that has appeared across various animations is none other than Adolf Hitler. One can't help but ask, why would the world of animation, often a refuge from real-world grimness, choose to reference Hitler, one of the darkest figures of the 20th century? Let's begin with the early cinematic portrayals. The 1940s witnessed a slew of animations that took satirical jabs at Hitler and the Nazi regime. Charlie Chaplin's The Great Dictator, though not strictly animated, stands out as a pioneering critique. Chaplin's portrayal of a bumbling dictator, Adenoid Hinkel, unmistakably mirrored the Fuhrer. Warner Brothers wasn't far behind with their beloved. Character Bugs Bunny often finding himself in conflict with cartoon versions of Nazi officials, including Hitler himself in shorts like Hair Meets Hair and The Master Race. The MGM cartoon Blitzwolf reimagined the tale of the three little pigs, with the antagonist wolf donning a familiar mustache, unmistakably parodying Hitler. Daffy Duck, another iconic character, similarly went head-to-head -head with the dictator in Daffy the Commando. Such portrayals aimed to diminish the terrifying aura surrounding Hitler by reducing him to a figure of ridicule. Jumping ahead to the realm of anime, Full Metal Alchemist Conqueror of Shambhala presents an alternative universe echoing the tumultuous backdrop of Hitler's early rise. Yujo Senki, Saga of Tanya the Evil, dances around direct references but immerses viewers in a world bearing stark resemblances to WWU and WWE2 Europe. Helsing introduces viewers to remnants of the Third Reich engaging in supernatural warfare, drawing further from Hitler's dark legacy. The world of modern cinema and television isn't immune to Hitler's influence either. Look Who's Back, a satirical film, imagines a scenario where Hitler awakens in contemporary Berlin, providing both humor and chilling commentary. Television shows like The Simpsons, South Park, and Family Guy have, over the years, woven Hitler into their narratives. Whether it's a fleeting reference or an entire episode dedicated to him, the objective remains the same, to offer commentary, provoke thought, or simply generate laughs. Anime series like Jojo's Bizarre Adventure and Attack on Titan subtly touch upon themes reminiscent of Nazi ideologies, hinting at the overarching influence of Hitler's worldview. The iconic graphic novel Mouse offers a poignant take on the Holocaust, using cats and mice as metaphors for Nazis and Jews, respectively. The shadow of Hitler looms large, symbolizing the terror he wrought. Such portrayals and references, spanning genres and mediums, underscore the indelible mark Hitler has left on global consciousness. By integrating him into animations and cartoons, creators are perhaps attempting to understand, critique, or simply remember a chapter from history that, for better or worse, has defined much of modern geopolitics. More surprising Hitler references. As we delve deeper into the realm of animation, 
the enigma of Hitler's presence persists. Despite the vast dichotomy between the light-hearted nature of cartoons and the grave reality of Hitler's actions, his figure continues to crop up in unexpected corners, challenging our perceptions and prompting deeper introspection. In the animated space, Disney's wartime propaganda cartoon Der Führer's Face stands out. Featuring Donald Duck in a nightmare setting of Nazi Germany, the cartoon aimed to caricature and mock the totalitarian regime, all the while emphasizing the value of freedom. Inglorious Bastards by Quentin Tarantino, though predominantly live action, incorporates elements of caricature and exaggerated reality, presenting an alternate history where a group of Jewish soldiers plots to assassinate Nazi leaders, including Hitler. This blend of brutal reality with elements of dark humor creates a unique narrative tapestry. Anime, with its expansive thematic range, hasn't shied away from references either. Black Lagoon, set in the crime-ridden seas of Southeast Asia, features neo-Nazis as antagonists in one of its arcs. The portrayal, while dramatic, underscores the lasting influence of Hitler's ideologies. In another anime, Tokyo Revengers, Gangs and symbols reminiscent of Nazi iconography are evident, although not directly attributed to Hitler. Such indirect references hint at the lasting, often insidious, impact of Nazi symbolism. Modern Western animations continue to dabble with Hitler references, too. The Animated Show Archer, known for its irreverent humor, features a storyline involving a clone of Hitler. Here, humor takes center stage, but the gravity of referencing a figure like Hitler is never entirely lost. The adult animated series Rick and Morty, never one to shy away from controversial topics, has made offhand references to Hitler and Nazi ideologies, blending dark humor with moments of unexpected depth. In the world of video games, the influence is equally apparent. Games like Wolfenstein, which revolve around defeating Nazis and their leaders, incorporate a fictionalized version of Hitler, balancing gameplay mechanics with the weighty backdrop of World War II. Bionic Commando, an older video game, presents a revived Hitler as the final boss, emphasizing the idea of confronting and defeating the evils of the past. Even children's programming hasn't been entirely immune. In Pinky and the Brain, a show about two mice trying to conquer the world, there's an episode where Brain's plans eerily mimic those of Hitler. While it's subtle and masked under humor, the reference is clear to older audiences. Similarly, Adventure Time, a show known for its layers of depth, showcases a character called the Lich King, whose desire for global domination and destruction parallels some of Hitler's ambitions. As these references accumulate, their collective impact becomes multifaceted. On one hand, they serve to satirize, critique, and even trivialize the real horrors associated with Hitler, making them more palatable for general audiences. But on the other hand, there's an inherent danger. Does constant exposure, especially in humorous or light-hearted contexts, risk desensitizing audiences to the true atrocities of Nazi Germany? Does it transform Hitler from a historical monster to just another character in popular culture? The last stretch of Hitler references in the animated world. In this final leg of our journey through the animated world's surprising engagement with Adolf Hitler, we encounter yet more instances where the notorious figure finds his way into the realm of cartoons and animes, each reference a reminder of the complex interplay between history, satire, and entertainment. The Simpsons, a long-running show that thrives on satirical humor, has featured Hitler in various episodes, showcasing the enduring impact of his legacy on modern culture. South Park, another animated series known for pushing boundaries, often uses Hitler to comment on contemporary political issues with an approach that deftly balances humor and introspection. Family Guy, too, has not shied away from Hitler references. Whether it's a fleeting joke or a more elaborate commentary, the show demonstrates how this historical figure continues to serve as a source of inspiration, satire, or critique. Anime series JoJo's Bizarre Adventure is known for its unique take on historical and pop culture references. Hitler's legacy is not directly addressed, 
but the themes and characters draw parallels with Nazi ideologies, reminding us of how the specter of the Third Reich continues to influence creative works. Attack on Titan, a popular anime series, doesn't explicitly mention Hitler, yet its narrative echoes themes of oppression, racism, and xenophobia, akin to the atmosphere prevalent in Nazi Germany. This subtlety demonstrates how historical context can seep into fictional worlds. Hitalia, Axis Powers, which personifies countries as characters, navigates the complexities of World War II, with Nazi Germany represented by a character named Germany. While Hitler himself isn't directly shown, the series engages with the broader context of the era. Maus, a graphic novel, offers a poignant portrayal of the Holocaust, using cats and mice as metaphors for Nazis and Jews, respectively. Hitler appears as the central antagonist, underscoring the graphic novel's unflinching depiction of history's darkest chapter. Night of the Living Dew, a parody of Scooby-Doo, places the gang in a scenario where they confront Nazi zombies, complete with caricatures that resemble Hitler. The Master Race, another Bugs Bunny cartoon, sees the iconic character facing off against Hitler, Hirohito, and Mussolini, quite literally on the road to hell. The Wolfenstein video game series features a fictionalized version of Hitler as a recurring villain, adding a layer of complexity to its gameplay that mirrors historical events. Bionic Commando, an older video game, positions a revived Hitler as the final boss, challenging players to confront the past in the form of a fictionalized adversary. Pinky and the Brain, a beloved animated show, has an episode where Brain's plans strikingly mimic Hitler's, offering a subtle reference that may be more apparent to adult audiences. Adventure Time, known for its layers of depth, introduces the Lich King, a character whose aspirations for global domination and destruction mirror some of Hitler's ambitions, hinting at the enduring influence of history. These final references emphasize how Hitler's presence endures, infiltrating the world of animation across genres and mediums. They offer creators a platform to grapple with history, using humor, satire, or critique to explore the complex facets of the past. Sandal's Lesser Known Ventures Beyond her iconic role as Valeria in Conan the Barbarian, Sandal Bergman's career ventured into lesser-known territories, where she continued to shine and contribute to the world of entertainment. While Valeria remains a beloved character, Sandal's journey encompassed workout videos, diverse film roles, and television appearances. In the 1980s, Sandal Bergman became a prominent figure in the fitness industry. Riding the wave of Jane Fonda's workout video craze, she ventured into instructing exercise routines. She featured prominently in the firm exercise videos, helping individuals across the country break a sweat and stay healthy. Sandhall Bergman's Body, released in 1983, offered viewers a unique fusion of ballet, jazz, stretches, and strengthening exercises. What set it apart was its accessibility, requiring minimal equipment, with a simple chair being the most advanced piece needed. Over time, it became a collector's item, a testament to her influence in the fitness world. Additionally, Sandal recorded The Firm Aerobics Workout with Weights Vulnera 3 Inches in 1990. Her dedication to fitness and well-being remained a constant throughout her career. However, her journey didn't stop at exercise videos. Sandal Bergman's versatility as an actress allowed her to take on a variety of roles in movies and TV shows. While her appearances might not have garnered as much attention as her role in Conan the Barbarian, well, I love Conan because it was like the sets were phenomenal, yeah. the costumes were phenomenal, and, and, and it's a generation movie. It's, I was six years old, you know, <laughs> uh, when my dad introduced right, me, and, they, and now he's a dad, yeah, and now all, all my daughter, I just showed it right to her on. the other day. They were essential steps in her career. In 1985, she featured in Red Sonia, a fantasy adventure film where she was initially offered the lead role, but chose to portray the villain instead. Her ability to adapt to different roles was a testament to her acting prowess. She also made her mark in Hell Comes to Frogtown in 1987, showcasing her capacity to embrace unconventional genres. In this post-apocalyptic comedy, 
she played a character named Spangle, adding her unique touch to the film. Her career witnessed an uptick in the 1990s, with over 10 movie appearances during that decade. One of the most famous was Ice Cream Man in 1995, a horror comedy where she demonstrated her range as an actress, navigating between horror and humor seamlessly. Television was another arena where Sandal left her mark. She appeared in shows like Designing Women, Swamp Thing, and Murder, She Wrote, each role reflecting her adaptability and versatility. The legacy of Conan the Barbarian. Conan the Barbarian, a film that brought to life Robert E. Howard's legendary character, left an indelible mark on the world of cinema, catapulted Arnold Schwarzenegger to superstardom, and even influenced the creation of iconic characters like He-Man. Let's explore the legacy of this epic fantasy film. Released in 1982, Conan the Barbarian was not only a cinematic triumph, but also a significant turning point in the career of Arnold Schwarzenegger. The film's storyline, adapted from Howard's 1930s fantasy stories, underwent a transformation, evolving from a futuristic epic envisioned by writer Oliver Stone to a gritty sword and sorcery adventure under the direction of John Milius. Arnold Schwarzenegger, a bodybuilder-turned-actor, was always the first choice to embody the titular role of Conan. His imposing physique, combined with his charisma, made him a perfect fit for the character. Schwarzenegger's portrayal of Conan was a breakthrough moment in his career, catapulting him to Hollywood stardom and solidifying his status as an action movie icon. One remarkable aspect of Conan the Barbarian was Sandal Bergman's portrayal of Valeria, Conan's love interest and an Amazonian warrior. While her name wasn't explicitly mentioned in the film, she brought a powerful and independent energy to the character. Her casting was a testament to her talent as an actress and dancer. Bergman's ability to handle her own stunts, along with her dance background, added a unique layer of grace to her character, particularly in the film's action sequences. The training that the main actors underwent for the film was grueling. Martial arts master Kiyoshi Yamazaki guided Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sandal Bergman, and other cast members through two-hour daily training sessions, three days a week, in Spain. I trained three months um, for the film and learned kendo. We would train like three days a week, maybe two and a half hours. This intense preparation contributed to the film's realistic and visceral combat scenes. Conan the Barbarian was not just a critical moment in Schwarzenegger's career, it also achieved significant success at the box office. Audiences flocked to theaters, filling three full auditoriums and forming long lines that wrapped around the block for hours. Most viewers were bodybuilders like Schwarzenegger himself, but the film's appeal extended to a wide range of moviegoers. During its initial release in 1982, the film earned an impressive $100 million, a substantial figure for its time. When accounting for home video sales, it raked in a staggering $300 million by 2007.